Good afternoon, grade 11, and your teachers and supervisors who are out there with you. Well, it's pressure time, this time of the year in grade 11, and I know the pressures are very, very great, but you know what's the best piece of advice I can give you? Is to take action. Don't worry, no worry is gonna solve your problem, but action is, and that's exactly why we're here this afternoon, to come and help you with a very important topic, one that will take you through to grade 12, in fact because this topic is also repeated in grade 12 and questions are asked about it. So, you had better listen very carefully today. Let's look at the screen and see what we are going to do. Three things I intend doing today. One, we're gonna remind you that charges, well, you know already since primary school and then high school, that charges are both positive and, of course, negative. And then if you want to calculate in grade 10, you've learned, if you want to calculate a new charge, especially when two charges or spheres have come into contact, this is the formula to use, and then you can calculate a new charge on each one. Also, we told you uh, in grade 10 already that if you want the number of electrons, then you take the present charge you have, or the charge given, and you divide it by the charge, one charge on an electron. But for today, we're definitely gonna talk about this one. You've done forces in grade nine, but today you're gonna hear what Coulomb's uh, role was in determining the, how big those forces are. In other words, a force between charge A and B or B and C. And we're going to tell you how to do it in one dimension and in two dimensions. And lastly, we'll take a look at what we call force fields with a symbol E. I call it electric field. Some call it electrostatic fields. But each charge that we have normally influence the area, the space around it, and that has an effect on other charges in that area. So that precisely is what we are going to do. But I need to remind you that you need to send us answers active. Remember what I said? Take action. So even if you can't calculate whatever your problem is, Send us an answer, try your luck. You never know when you are right. Let's quickly see what is the number in the studio again. There's our website number. There is our WhatsApp number. You have that by now. And you have our SMS number to send us messages here in the studio. Then, of course, it's important that we quickly look what you know about charges and just to remind you about one, two, or three things in that. Let's look at our screen again. Since what grade? Grade eight, you have learned that all atoms have protons in the nucleus and the electrons are negatively charged. In fact, to give you a bit of history, that Robert Millikan, he's the one that found, that quantized the charge on the electron. He said this is the most fundamental charge you can get the electron. And he did his uh, experiments and he is the one who came up with the charge on one electron. That's the value is given to it. Furthermore, we find that Benjamin Franklin, the one that you see here, he was actually a mathematician, a scientist, a lot of things in one, but he is the one that called them positive and negative charges. And when we say something is positively charged, we mean that there are more protons than electrons in an atom or a group of atoms and we then say positively charged uh, particles are electron deficient. In other words, they are uh, too few electrons. On the other hand, we also say when something is negatively charged, we mean there are more electrons than protons in such a substance or such a metal, if you will. Now, what is important here is that you need to remember the following that Coulomb is the one, or the man is sitting here, Frenchman, he, we call the unit of charges after him. It's a capital C, and that's the way we spell the unit of charges. And one Coulomb is roughly 6.25 billion billion electrons. Yes, one Coulomb, that charge, and the symbol for charge, of course, is Q. And because one Coulomb is such a huge number, 6.25 billion billion, 10 to the power 18 electrons, we find that we work with smaller units most of the time. 
and we then have to do conversions like centicoulomb, millicoulomb, microcoulomb, nanocoulomb, and picocoulomb, and so forth and so forth. And these are the conversions. So you have to take one coulomb and multiply by 10 to the power of 2 if you want a centicoulomb. But that makes sense. Centi means 100, and milli means 1,000, and so forth, and so forth. So there you have an idea about what you should know by now or what you're supposed to know when we call something negatively charged, too many electrons. When something is positively charged, too few electrons. And then, of course, micro and milli and nanocoulombs. Those are the kind of things that you have to know. But one more thing. So who was this gentleman Coulomb in the corner here? Let's have a look again. There you see a diagram of him. I'm going to show you him again and talk a little bit about him, what he's done. We say that he's the one who studied the forces exerted by one charge on another, and he came up and said, well, let's find out exactly, exactly how these charges affect one another. In other words, let's find the numbers. Let's see how strong they are, and of course, how weak those forces are. And by the way, here's a trick question. Can you tell me why my body, your body, stays in one piece all the time? Answer that question for you. It's electrostatics. That's one of the most important reasons why you have to learn this. Let's just quickly look again what Coulomb, Charles de Coulomb was up to. He says, well, we know that by now, that like charges repel, and we all know by now that they, that opposite charges, they attract. But do you know that the force between that this charge, this charge exerting on that one, which is by the green, the F2, is the same as the force that that one exerts, that this one exerts on that one. So the forces are of equal magnitude. Remember Newton 3 when body A and body B? That's right. So whenever you have two charges, the forces that they exert on each other is equal. So I can calculate you what's the force on this one. Then the question might have said, what's the, what's the force on, on Q2? And you exactly the same. If this Q1 attracts Q2, it attracts him with the same force but in opposite direction according to Newton 3. Now, one more thing about uh, Charles de Coulomb is that he worked and he found out that, well, these charges, and we can actually calculate and say how big these forces are, and we call that Coulomb's law. That's why you see it in the corner there at the bottom of my screen. So we can come to Coulomb's law, and we're going to discuss a little bit of what he said. His law says the following. He says, if you want to calculate the electrostatic force or the size of the electrostatic force that one point charge exerts on another point charge, then you must keep two things in mind. Now, I wonder, you've studied this chapter already. Do you know what those two things are? He says, if you want to take one charge, let's say a big one, and a smaller one, and you want to figure out what is the force between them, you must keep two things in mind. So our calculations will always be based on those two things, and here they are on the screen for you once again. He says, one, that force will vary according to the magnitude of the product. It is directly proportional, in fact, to the magnitude of the product of the charges. So you take charge one, charge two, you multiply the charges on them, and then you find out just how big the force is. So the bigger the charges in terms of negative or positive, the greater the force will be. And his second point was, it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. That's if you have point charges, or if you have spheres for that matter. But by the way, you have already come across such a law before, haven't you? Whose law was that? Of course, it was our old friend Newton's law of universal gravitation, where he spelled out to us, the further you move apart, the weaker your force becomes, and the closer you come, the stronger the force becomes. It's called an inverse square law. Now, here is the format of Coulomb's law. Similar to Newton's one, 
force, electrostatic force, is equal to a constant. They we have we call it a proportionality constant, but it's a constant with a number. And then you multiply the charges of Q1 and Q2, and you divide it by the square of the distance between their centers. And of course, you know that by now, and you can do it, but I'll test you now. now. Let's quickly get to the last part of this before we put you to work. So lastly, we say there are some learning tips for you. And what are those learning tips? One, K, you find always on formula sheets. And you don't have to put in the signs of the charge, in other words, negative or positive, when you use this formula. And of course, we must be able to judge proportionalities. In other words, what we mean by that is we must be able to judge long distance, weaker force, or bigger charges, the greater the force. That we mean by proportional direct, according to the size of the charges, or inversely proportional to the size of the distance between their centers. Now, just let's show you a graph quickly so that we, before we come to our first example. In the graph, of course, we say that the force is direct proportional, starting at uh, origin zero, to the product of the charges. So multiply these two. In other words, if I have the product of those two here, then I get that force. If I work the product of the two charges get bigger, then I have a bigger force. Are you getting the idea? If my product of my charges become huge, then I have a huge force as well. And the next graph, oh sorry, the way we write it is we say the force therefore is proportional, directly proportional to the product of charge one and charge two. Number two, we say that the force and the square of the distance is inversely proportional. That means if the radius is small, I get a huge force. If the radius is very huge, I get a small force. And this is the way we write the proportionality. We say that the force is inversely proportional to the square of the radius. And of course, sometimes we can take this graph and change it to this. How did we do that? I'm not sure whether you can see on your screen, but here in the corner, I have the inverse proportional. So always look what is on the x-axis. If it's directly square of the distance, or this one inversely, then the graphs look different, but they mean the same things. And lastly, reminded to you, this is what Coulomb's law looks like. Now, I think it's time that we do some work. Let's see what was the first challenge I'm going to give to you, and let's work it out together to see where, where we arrive at. Look at my screen again. Okay, number one, there is a, an example of a ratio, and it says that two charges experience a force F, so the force is F, when held at distance R apart. How would this force be affected if one charge is doubled, the other charge is tripled? three times, and the distance is halved. Wow, there is a lot of things going on here. So let's start by trying to do this for you on the whiteboard. Let's do it here on the whiteboard together, and let's see how we do that precisely. So number one, we are saying that if I, I have a force F there, and the force is F, and that force is equal to, remember the normal format, K, Q1, product Q2, and over the square of the distance. That is the normal standard way of writing the force. But now I'm going to change something. I'm going to make some changes to it, and here are the changes. Change 1, change 2, and change 3. Those are the changes. So now I have to say, I'm going to include the changes into this formula. And then I'm going to write it as K. All right, that's K. That's the old constant. That never changes. But one of them changes. Charge one changes to double. Double the charge. So I'll make that in red. Okay. So I think, I think I'll do all the charges in red. So 
Q1 is doubled. So I've done that part. Now Q2, Q number two is tripled. So Q2 is tripled three times Q2. Okay, so I've done that part. And now I say, and the distance is half. Now you must watch carefully. So I get not R, not one R, but half R. Oh, I should have done that in red, isn't it? I should have done that in red half, because that is changing. In this one, I'm doing all the changes. So it's now half an R instead of the normal one R, and I square all of that. So you see what changes I brought about? Exactly what they told me. Double charge one, triple charge two, half the distance. And now I simplify the mathematics in here. And what I do is I multiply that by that one. And I simplify this. In other words, I square a half as well. So therefore, I will get K again. Nice, nice. And I will get 2 times that is 6. So I'll put the 6 in front. I take the numbers out of my equation. You'll see now why I want that. And then I will get Q1 again multiplied by Q2. Let me just stop there. Just to realize, you see what I did there now? Did you see? I simplified the top one by multiplying two by three, and that gives me the six there. Okay, now why on earth would I want to keep this? I'll tell you now, now. Let's first simplify this one. So I'll take this out of the bracket now, because I just want R, but a half a squared is a quarter, all right? And then I still have my R squared. Now you're asking, can you see that that is still my force F? That is equal to that, and here's the change that happens to the force. And I'm going to do it in this way. So I'm going to say that then is equal to ah, 6 multiply or divide by a quarter. Where can I do it? You're on the side. Let's do it here. I'm just going to do the numbers. I'm going to keep that constant. Divide by a quarter is equal to 6 over 1. Multiply. When I multiply, I inverse 4 over 1, and that is 24. 6 multiplied. You see what I did there? I inverse that side. So this time around, those two there, those two here, I'm like, I think I'll, I'll, round, I'll make that one in green. No? If I simplify that, the maths on that side, then I get 24. That is 24 times. And that one there is my old force, just like that one was equal to F. So therefore, that means if that is F there, because this is equal to F, that means I now have 24 times the force. That is how we, what we mean by ratios. That is what we mean by ratios. In other words, how is the force changing? Let's just quickly look at my screen and summarize the main ideas again for you. Okay. So we say we write the formula down like that. We then make the changes that we come across. You got it? We make the changes there. Look carefully at the changes. Look very carefully at the changes. Double, triple, half. Notice what we did there. And notice how we put the di difference of the distance in brackets here at the bottom. Just watch carefully. We put that in brackets to indicate that must be squared. And then we say we get multiply the top one. 2 times 3 is 6. We put it outside of my formula. And then I divide by a quarter. So half squared is quarter. And there I get the answer. And then I can quickly see it's 24 times. 24 times my old formula 
that is equal to f, so this must also be equal to f, and therefore I get my final answer as 24 times the force. There you have what we call ratio and proportion, and that is very important that you are able to do that. Now, as if that wasn't enough, let me give you another example then of Coulomb's law before we actually go on to electric fields. Let's look at the screen again and find out something about Coulomb's law. There's an example, and it looks very intimidating if you look at it, but it simply says that we have a charge B in a corner. By the way, this is two-dimensional, and it is influenced by charge, charge C in this dimension, in, in along this axis, along this plane, and we call this the one, one dimension. And then we see that charge B is also influenced by this charge A, because remember Coulomb said that there is a force between any two charges, and we can use Coulomb's law for it. In fact, there is Coulomb's law in the corner there for you. So we say this is another dimension. So we've got one dimension, this direction, and another one. So we'll do it one by one. I, I suggest we do A and B first in this dimension, and we do it then in that dimension, and then we find the net. Now, the net electrostatic force, just like in F net, means the sum of the forces. So in this case, we work out the vertical force first, then we work out the horizontal force, and then afterwards we pack them together. We add up the sum, keeping the directions in mind because forces are vectors. Okay, so let's start immediately. Here is my board. Let's get down to it immediately, and let's see how far we can get. So, number one, I'm suggesting to you that we do these two first. Two charges at a time, and we use Coulomb's law, as simple as that. So, we say we're going to find out the force of A on B. So we write that the force, let me see if I must write this, the force of A on B, that's how we write it, that force of A on B, is equal to, what again? We have our constant, and then we have charge A and charge B. So it's charge A's influence on charge B. So we're going to do the horizontal version first. And we divide that by the square of the distance between the centers. And so how do we get this? Now we know the value of K. If you don't, you better learn it fast. K is 9 times 10 to the power 9. Okay. I close that in brackets because I always like to have my things neat and tidy in front of me. And then I'm going to multiply it by Q. Now I look carefully. What is Q? A charge A. There we have charge A. And charge A is 5 micro coulombs. Make sure you understand that. It is 5 micro means 10 to the power minus 6 coulombs. And charge B is minus 10 microcoulombs. Okay. Now, I've said earlier that we don't have to put in these the signs of the charges. We don't have to put it in. I just want to show you because we know that this is going to be attractive. That's a negative and positive, so they're going to attract. So that one will probably come down this way. You get the idea? So this one will probably move down in this direction. That's the direction of the force that we will eventually get. Okay, now let's put all of this. If I can get my ruler quickly, let's put all of this over the square of the distance between the centers. Okay, and the distance between the centers, if I look carefully, is 10 millimeter, I have it there. So it means it is 10 milli means a thousand, so that means I'm going to multiply by 10 to the power minus 3. And then, don't forget it, I, I almost forgot now for a minute, I must square that. Okay, 
So that's clear. Now, if you now take your uh, calculator and you work that out and you get to an answer, I'm sure that you are busy doing it, you find that that answer eventually is going to give you 4,500 newtons. 4,500 newton. And in which direction is it? Because I'm working with a force which is a vector. So I must give the direction. It is downwards. I think that's what it will say. It will be downwards. I think that is safe to say that. Okay, so there we have it. So that's our calculation there. And I have to squeeze the other one in here, so I'll do it faster. Same idea, but this time we're going to go in that direction. We're going to go in that direction. This is the one dimension, and that is the other dimension. So I have here now a two-dimension uh, example there. So let's go faster now. You now understand what to do. So force of which one now? Of C on B, remember? B is the common one. It's in the corner. It's affected by both these. So it's force of C on B. And I'm going to go faster now. Is K, Q, wait a minute, must be Q, C. That's right, because Q, C is affecting charge B over R squared. Everybody clear? And then I simply start plugging in. I hope I will have enough space now. And that is 9 times 10 to the power 9. I'm writing slightly smaller, but I think by now you can know what it is. And C, according to me, is 7 times 10 to the power minus 6. This is 7 micro. Micro is 10 to the power. So it's 7 times 10 to the power minus 6. And, of course, the other one I know already is 10 to the power I'm going to write this small here, 10 to the power minus 6. Okay. And all of that, over what's the distance between them? 15. So 15 milli. So I must convert. You see how important your conversions are? All squared. And then if I calculate it out, I think, if I calculate it out, I get 2,800. It's force. So it must be newtons. Let's quickly work out what kind of force this is. Let us just see. It's a positive and a negative. Okay, so this positive one here is going to attract the negative one, so it will be to the right. To the right hand side. Okay, so there are my two forces there. So one force is that. And then I've got to do, of course, what I have to do after that is now I have to add up the two forces. Let us quickly look at the screen and find out what we have done so far in order to help you. So I'm going to do that direction first. And there we see it. We see that we have uh, a one dimension. That way we're going to do it from here till there. See what influence A has on B and then later what influence C has on B. So there is my answer to that first one, which we've just done. So that should not be such a problem. And now I'm going to do the second one. I'm going to do the second one, and that is I'm going to do to draw here in the corner to tell you the force is downwards. Then I'm going to do that direction, and I calculate that, and I get my forces there. You got that? So this is for the vertical direction. And the force is downwards. And this one is for the horizontal direction. And that force is which direction? Ah, to the right. We said that. And now how do we find the net force? Of course, you've done this. This tail to head to, to, head to tail. We've done this. So I might get my net force from the one tail to the other one set. So that will be the direction of my net force. Hey, but you're going to look and see, but I know this. This triangle looks very familiar since maths in grade 8. Of course, this is Pythagoras. So I can now say, if I know this answer, which is 2,800, and I know that answer, which is 4,500, then I can use Pythagoras, square here, square there, add them up, and I get this one's answer by taking the square root. That you know already. 
So I am just going to take you through it without actually uh, doing it a long way around. Or my, maybe I might just reinforce it a little bit by saying what we are going to do, and that would help you. So let's quickly look here on my whiteboard again. So I say I'm going to draw a vector diagram. We know the one force is directly downwards, directly downwards, and that force downwards is 4,500, okay? And then another force is in this direction. This is between which two again? That was A was pulling on B. And then we say, well, the other force, must, remember my head must come there now, so I must make the head of the other one there. And that one was around about 2,800. That's right, 2,800 newtons. I'm just putting in numbers now. Okay, let me put the newton, the unit. Otherwise, you're going to say, yes, but you always tell us to remember. And then, how do I find, because that is a right angle there now. So how do I find my resultant? I always go from the tail of the first to the head of the other one. And there I have it. And that's going to be my F net. So that is the plan I'm going to do. So I'm going to square this side plus square that side, square that, and then find the square root to find f. So I use Pythagoras quickly. So maybe we must see how we're going to use Pythagoras here in this case. Let us quickly go do it down here. So what do we say? So I'm going to use Pythagoras, and I'm going to work lower down now, and I say f net, f net square one, well, I could use a single one because by now you know a lot about this, this math, how to do this. And that will be the square of the force of A on B plus the force, force square of B on C. Notice how B is the common one because the B that A affects and B that C affects. And that is equal to, let me find out, that will be 4,500 square. I'll square that quickly. Plus 2,800 square, squared. And then, of course, to find what F is, I simply take the square root of that one, and that will give me F net. And therefore, if I take my calculator and I take add it up, add it up, and find the square root, I'll get 5,300 newtons. Which direction? That's what the next thing is. Newtons, we put in the direction now. So how do we get, so by the way, this then is 5,300 newtons. For not F squared, for F itself, the F net. Now how do I get the direction? Now you must watch very carefully because this is an interesting part. Your angle that you select is always against the x-axis. There we go. That's theta. I'll just make a long line through there now. So how do we get it? We put that over that, which is opposite over adjacent. Blue is opposite theta. Green is adjacent. So that means I have 10 opposite over adjacent. Oh, yes. It's 10. 10 of theta. Okay. So, tan of theta, therefore, means that the opposite will be this one, this value, over that value. If I rewrite it, so tan theta, tan theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. That means if I just want theta, I must get rid of the tan. So, in the other side becomes the arctan, or the tan minus 1. And that would therefore be, which side? It would be force A, B. That's right, this one first. Force of A, B, all right, over the force of, which one? C on B. And which is then equal to 10 minus 1. And that would give me of what? of 4,500, I just take that value there, because this side over that side, so it's 4,500 over 2,800, and then if I put that into my calculator, I get 58. 
at 38,11 degrees. Someone told me that is. That's right. That is the answer. So it means it is that at, now I must describe this carefully. I'm describing this and that angle. So that angle is below the positive axis, below the positive axis. So I write there below positive x axis. Positive x, x axis. OK. I think let me quickly explain again one time to you. I must say it takes a lot of maths. It finds you to un you must understand vectors. Then you need to understand Pythagoras. And then lastly, you must know how to get an angle by using side over side. Well, if I had two other sides, I could have used uh, sine or cosine. But in this case, the tan worked out very well. Let's quickly look at it again and see what I've done on the screen. So what do we say? We say we know the one force was in this direction, the other force was in that direction, and then we find our resultant by running that force there. Everybody's got that quite right. Not so. Then I put in some values or at least symbols so that I can properly understand that what I'm doing. So that means, let me just go through it again. This means this was the force of A was was exerting on B, and this means the force that C was exerting, C was in this corner, I think, exerting on B. C was pulling B this way, and A was pulling B down. And then I find F net. And then, of course, I go to Pythagoras, and there is the same story I've shown you earlier on. I simply take the square on this side is equal to the square on that side is equal to the square on that side. Okay. And then I, to get the F net, I take the square root of the values, and that's my answer. And then in order to get the angle between them, there's theta in the corner. So theta is always the angle between the x-axis and the line you've drawn. Here's the F net, there's the x-axis, and that's always theta. Okay, and then I find the tan value. Tan of theta is equal to opposite of adjacent. In other words, the only values I have is this one and that one, opposite to theta, chasing to theta, and there I work it out for you. And then I write out my answer like that. That is very important that you are able to do that. Then, of course, what is even more important is that you know what we mean by the following two terms. And those terms are a point charge which is a charge with very small mass and physical size, virtually no mass. And the test charge is a very small charge, which is a very small point charge. So point charge you can just think of as a dot that I make with a pencil point in mathematics, and that is what a point charge. And a test charge is a positive charge. We will be using that, that very shortly. OK, and that's Coulomb's law. So Coulomb's law tells us we can work out the forces. But how do we work? one charge to the next one. We just simply don't add three or four charges. Right, now we come to the second part. Remember part one was, what is Coulomb's law? Coulomb's law is a law that tells us what is the relationship, the force relationship between two charges at a time. Like firstly two this way, then two that way. Now we come to the next big idea, and the next big idea is called an electric field. And what is the symbol for an electric field again? Yes, many learners want to write an F, but it's not. Let's have a quick look and see what we got here. OK, so electric field around a charged object. That is an important thing that you need to understand. And one of the things that you need to be able to do is to describe an electric field. It's a region of space in which an electric charge experiences a force. Wait. A regional space in which an electric charge experiences a force. And the direction of the electric field at the point is the direction of the positive test charge. Whoa, too many things to remember. Let me get it simplified, and then we go on to explaining a little bit more. If this is a charge, then obviously this charge changes the space around it, 
and that we will say it's a region in space. So I can say there's a force in that direction or 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 force in that direction. So it changes, just like gravity changes the space around it, so do electric charges, they change the space around them. So if I bring another charge in this one's field, then this charge is gonna experience a force, either attraction or repulsion. You get the idea. So around the space, it's almost like magnets, you understand the idea very well if I talk about magnets. But that is what charges do, and that's how we work out electricity and electrostatic charges, and that's how our body is kept together, because the one small charge is kept to the other small charge, is connected to the other one, so our body stays into one piece. And you must use a lot of force to rip these electrostatic forces of charge. Yes, they are some of the strongest forces we can find apart from nuclear forces. So the next thing I think I must tell you is that we must define what the point charge and talk about this concept before we do our last exercise for this afternoon. Let's quickly look. So we say, if we want to define an electric field, which is actually a force at a point, so we say an electric field at a point is the electrostatic force that is experienced by a positive unit charge. So a positive unit charge is a, is a point charge, we call it a test charge, and that red there is my test charge and that red one. So this one experiences a greater force, why is that? Because it's closer, that's right. Because it's close, I was about to ask you, why is that? Because we said it's an inverse square law. That means if it's close, then attraction is greater. If it's further away, then attraction gets weaker. And that's exactly what's happening on our screen right there. So we say that this one is experiencing a greater force. It's positive, so it will be kicked out, and that's why my arrows show out. And that one will experience a lesser force because it's further away from my field that is causing it. And I normally use symbols for it. This is uh, capital Q, and that's a small Q. The test charge normally gets a small Q. So let's, so let's quickly go to this. So one, we say our, our charge that caused the field, that's our test charge Q there. And what do we see? We say in symbols, the electric field E is the force on the charge. The force of this one on that charge is pulling it this way. You get it? Well, in this case, it's pushing it away. And what else do we need to know? We know that if we use E, that's electric field, that is small q there, that one there is the charge that's experiencing the force, and a big Q here is the one that's causing the force. That one there, a big one there, is the one that causes the force. So we have two formula that we can use. Now, we have about uh, seven minutes just to run through another problem which can be quite, quite, quite challenging. Are you ready for it? But you're in grade 11, you're almost grade 12, almost university two years from now. So let's quickly see what this problem, I'll explain it only on there, I won't do it here. We will have not too much time in order to do that. So let's quickly see and look at the example that we have. Number one, if we have to draw these field patterns before you go out. You must be able to draw them because it helps a lot when you do your problems. That's a positive charge. A, a test charge there will go away, and for a negative one, a test charge, positive charge would come in, and of course, you know the superposition from grade 10 already. Please draw them. Make sure we say you must be able to draw, and they have been asked in papers, and in this one, they repel, and that's why they go into infinity away. And this is an electric field uh, on a sphere of a positive charge. Of course, if it was a negative charge, the lines would go, come in just like there. Positives away towards the negatives. From positives away always towards the negatives. Okay, so that's it. And now we can apply those ideas. So here's an example three. Example three says that I have two charges, positive microcoulomb, 10 to 4 multiplied by 10 to the minus 6 Coulomb. And we have another charge, minus 3, there we are, micro Coulombs, minus 3 times 10 to the power minus 6 Coulombs. That's what we have here. So this is what we're going to do. And we see that this one is 
comma 2, comma 3 meters from point P. Point P is located to the right of the 3 minus 3 microcoulomb. So from here to point P, we're going to have comma 3 meters. And from here to point P is going to be 0 comma 1 meters. So what shall we have to do? We have to keep a few things in mind. And what are those? Oh, the question says that we must calculate the net electric field. Let me explain quickly to you. In other words, get the sum of the two electric fields. I'm going to take you through my reasoning of how I'm going to do the sum. So I'm going to say one thing. I must put a test charge here at point P. Then I must see what will, do, what will this one, this charge, do to my point charge, and what will that one do to my point charge. Are you getting the idea? So first things first. I put the point charge there at P. I put one at the bottom and one on top because I'm going to draw arrows here for you. So there's my point charge. Now question, net electric field means the sum. And here is the first electric field. And two, there's the second electric field. OK. So what do I do now? Let's talk about this one first. Very far. How many meters away? Comma three. So that means it's going to be a weak force. Which direction? Well, a positive and a positive would push me in that direction. Are you getting it? So the positive and positive would put me in that direction. So there I put my positive charge there. What does it do to the other positive one here? My arrow shows me it's pushing away that way. And see how important your drawings are? So the arrow will go in that way. Do you understand the electric field? In other words, the pushing of the force will be in that way. And now let's take this one. This one is quite close to this one. So I expect the force to be greater. But let me first put my negative charge there. My negative charge, there I have it. So now what happens? What's going to happen between this one and this one? My force will be in this direction. In other words, my, this one, my electric field will run in this direction. This negative will pull this positive one in this direction. And it will be a stronger force because the distance is only 0, 0,1 meters, whereas the whole distance here was 0, 0,3 New Coulomb's law. So there I go. So my force for this one will be in this direction. And there I have the two. And I can just add them up, that one plus that one. So let's quickly just do that. Let's see how we do that. You think you got that one? You think you're good? Let me just explain one quick time on my board for you what's going to happen, and then we can go. So I put up a test charge there, a positive one, and I say, what will happen between this one and this one? And I say, well, the field is inwards towards negative, and therefore my force will be that direction. Quite a strong force. And then I ask myself, and what will happen between this one and that one? Well, it's a positive and a positive, so it will push the field, will be away from a positive one. So therefore, it will be that way. And all I do now, mathematically, I get the values and I add it up. Let me show you quickly how I do it in three minutes. Just look at this quickly. So then I use this formula and I say the net force, meaning sum of the, fo of the fields, is equal to the field of four, that is that one, and the field of three added together. So here we go. Let's quickly see. So one, I say there is my positive charge. And there's my formula. Formula, that is the charge now there. That one, that charge there, that comes in there. That distance comes in there. Okay, so there I go. And I do it, I add. This is K. That's right, that's K. That is the charge up top there, 10 to the power minus 6. And that's my distance squared. Right, let's go again. K Q R squared. K Q R squared. And then I go that when I see that's my answer. Now I'm gonna do it for this one again. Look at my formula again. So there's my so that's the first force, and now I do my second formula for which one? For this one now, for the minus three one. So let's do it. There's my minus three electric field, K Q distance. Answer, there I get it. What do I do now? Very simple. I add up, I get E net, and I take down this answer and that answer. 
Let me first draw the arrow for this one for you. And there's the arrow to that side. So actually what I got to do, this one here is represented by that arrow and that answer by that arrow. And now I just add up these two. And this is the way I do it. I say the net electric field at P is the field caused by the 4 microcoulomb and the force caused by the minus 3 microcoulomb. There is that answer. And there is that answer. Add the two. And that is, if I use my calculator, I get 2,3 times 10 to the power 6. You might just wonder why I have 10 to the power 6 here and not 10 to the power 5. I made that one times smaller and that one times bigger. That's why I've got 0, 0,4 there. And that is what we do, how we do it. You must have a look at this video again to understand, and you need to practice it a lot. Let me just give you a summary of what we've done today. So today we did with you some of the electrostatics, and the first thing we told you that electrons are positive and negative, and protons are positive, and that we find that when we have a surplus of electrons, we have a negative charge, surplus of protons, and we have a positive charge. Number two, we told you that Coulomb's law tells us that some repel and others attract, but we can work out how strong. Number three, we told you that every charge has an electric field around it, and you can work out how strong is the electric field with the letter E. You can either use that one if you have the distance and the big charge, but you can use this one if you have the force and the small charge. And lastly, we told you that you must be able to draw electric fields around charges. Like this is a positive one away, that's a positive one away, that's a negative one towards. That is how the field goes. And lastly, we wish you good luck with the exams, and we hope that your results will be very close to an A+, plus if you study electrostatics very well. Everything of the best for the final exams, and see you next year in grade 12. Bye-bye.